Nicholas, uh, Chief Sean Atlio. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dennis Cochran, and I'm the president of St. Thomas University. Au nom de St. Thomas University à l'Université de Nouveau-Brunswick, c'est avec grand plaisir que je vous souhaite la bienvenue au Chief uh, Atlio au Congrès 2011. Je veux également vous souhaiter la bien, euh, plus bien sincère bienvenue à cette conférence spéciale. On behalf of St. Thomas University and the University of New Brunswick, we're very pleased to welcome uh, the Grand Chief to our uh, campus, and we're very pleased to welcome you to this very special session today. This talk is not only part of the widely successful Big Thinkers Lecture serve Series, it is also part of the Indigenous Education Programming sponsored by the Equity Issues Portfolio. As head of the Assembly of First Nations, Chief Atlio has made education a priority. He has forcefully challenged governments, universities, colleges, corporations, and citizens to form a common cause on one of our most pressing public policy issues. Aboriginal education is one of Congress's three sub-themes, and other big thinking lecture speakers are addressing uh, themes of reconciliation and residential schooling. Here in New Brunswick, our government, our universities, and leaders in our native community are working hard to increase Aboriginal student participation and success in post-secondary education. And unfortunately, uh, as in spite of the fact that we're all working together and we have a common cause, we are not getting the level of success uh, that our First Nation children deserve. And uh, certainly we appreciate the comments that you've made nationally, the attention you're bringing to this issue, and hopefully the motivation uh, that you will provide, not just in your speeches, but in your presentation here today, to all of us uh, to work harder and hopefully be more successful. All the partners recognize that we have much more to do, and we are keenly interested in what uh, Chief Atlio has to say. I would now like to call upon our Lieutenant Governor, who is no stranger to the St. Thomas University campus, uh, to come forward and do the formal introduction of the Chief. Your Honour. <clears throat> Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, bonjour. And in my language, Danagakalo Gilawa. It gives me great pleasure, of course, to have this uh, responsibility of saying a few words about our national chief. Uh, chief Atli, of course, uh, is a hereditary chief. And he was also elected for a three-year mandate uh, to be the national leader of the Assembly of First Nations. And I've read a lot about his work. In the 1970s and 80s, First Nations in Canada tried to set up what is called distant education programs. Uh, they were talking about satellite access to uh, distant communities who would have opportunities. Chief Atlio is one of the ones who, in fact, was able to uh, participate and become a member of uh, that particular technology. And I had an opportunity to speak to him just a little bit about that a little while ago. And it's rem what's remarkable about that is that uh, the collaboration of the four universities from four different continents almost to work together on a particular um, project and thesis that he worked on. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting more information from him, what that experience was like. Also, of course, uh, last, uh, on October, uh, last fall, uh, Chief Atlio uh, was at the ceremony of the installation of our Governor General. And uh, we were all gathered there and he gave a very moving uh, performance, first of all, of song, of his culture, and at the end, uh, he gave uh, the Governor General, in fact, the drum, indicating to him the significance of this in, in his culture. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to also uh, welcome National Chief Atlio here in our presence. I'm looking forward to his comments as well. Thank you very much, Chief Atlio. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Your Honor. Uh, what he left out is that by giving uh, the Governor General a drum, I broke protocol. 
Um, but uh, the, uh, uh, His Excellency assured me that it was okay. <laughs> and in the Lieutenant uh, Governor here, I think uh, we have somebody uh, who I think not only makes uh, this province proud, but Indigenous peoples uh, proud and uh, had the opportunity to congratulate you when you were seated uh, and installed. Um, something very exciting, and, and I also learned that he is uh, related. This uh, is, we're actually gonna go right to all the stereotypes here. They're all related, right? <laughs> so it turns out that he's first, co first cousin, closely related, a cousin to Gwen Point, who is married to, to uh, Stephen Point. Am I getting it right? Part of, that's okay. Part of it. Anyway, the point, the point being is they're related to uh, the British Columbia Lieutenant Governor. So coast to coast, we are related. That's my point that I'm trying to make here. We're all linked. I want to uh, thank you for uh, the kind inv uh, invitation and, uh, and welcome and introduction and uh, thank the President as well. Uh, the story about uh, the online master's program uh, that I'd shared uh, and uh, the introduction overall it makes it sound like these were sort of my decisions and um, I am the son of somebody and the reason why I learned about this online program was because my mother said son there's this great master's program that you should look at hint hint nudge nudge the way uh, parents are supposed to do and my mom is actually also here uh, Marlene Atlio, Dr. Marlene Atlio who's presenting at the conference. So this is, uh, it's always a story of uh, the apple not falling far. And it's a bit of a family event being here in this, uh, in this wonderful conference. My father has a book being um, uh, displayed by UBC Press in the book fair, so I'm gonna plug the book, it's walk, check it out. Uh, I think it's an important contribution to uh, the maintenance and the, the promotion of uh, the validity of indigenous worldviews, uh, the book walk, but he's also got another book coming out this August, which. UBC Press is going to be uh, publishing, and that'll be out uh, shortly. I think it's referred to as The Embrace. That's the, the title. And uh, Mum's here presenting uh, in the area of story work. Um, my dad may be having this vigorous academic warriorship going on. And, uh, and then Mum using things like food and stories, uh, the way it always was for me growing up as a kid. And uh, so I'm a very thankful son. That was what I wanted to, to begin with. And uh, very, very honored to be here. Uh, to also uh, say in, in, in my, my language, the Maliseet, uh, particularly the, the St. Mary's, and uh, the Hatwit uh, to the Chief, Candace Paul, recognizing them first of all uh, for welcoming all of us into their territories and uh, to this wonderful, wonderful conference. It, uh, this uh, conference uh, is, is really important to me and to us as the Assembly of First Nations. Very thankful for the theme and the sub-themes that have been chosen here. The overall theme of coasts and continents coming up very clear, coming from the West Coast and recognizing the relationships that we have coast to coast to coast in this country. But also I'm here with Regional Chief Roger Augustine and would, I'd like to ask to stand and be acknowledged. Regional Chief for New Brunswick and PEI is here, my colleague on the National Executive. <laughs> And so there, therein it begins, uh, by a little bit of context, understanding uh, what our roots are and where we're coming from and understanding the context of this place, the hosting of the universities, the recognition of the peoples. Uh, Elder Bear, I'm not sure if she's in the room or not, but holding, thank you so much for the cultural sharing and for the prayers, uh, starting us off here in, in this very beautiful way, especially with the children, to hear the language, the songs, it's always so very, very inspiring. I also, uh, something that I wanted to touch on a little bit uh, later, but uh, reference it now, I really love the lecture of, of David Hackett uh, Fisher. And uh, my, my colleagues at the AFN, they, they always uh, take great joy in teasing me about my love of reading. And uh, that's one book, Champlain's Dream, that was particularly inspiring. And I'm thankful for other colleagues from the Assembly of First Nations being here with us today as well. Our CEO, Richard Jock, uh, is, is with us, and my colleague, Bonnie Leesk. And so we at the Assembly of First Nations felt so very strongly about being invited to be here. And uh, that uh, while we may have, as we've heard already, um, some, uh, some great challenges, there are um, nonetheless uh, some 
phenomenal opportunities. And uh, the future might look difficult, it might look complex, but I recall uh, being in school in grade 11 algebra and having uh, the algebra teacher um, hit me on the head more than once because it seemed to be okay at that time to do that and say, boy, he was a big man from the Caribbean. He says, you're going to be a basket weaver. You're going to be a basket weaver. That's what I, that spoke to my abilities or inabilities or lack of confidence when it came to algebra. And I'd go home to mom and dad and I'd say, dad, I can't do this algebra. It's just too hard. Son, you can have what you say. Oh, I was so frustrated with that. You can have what you say, son. It's too hard, Dad. I can't get this algebra. Too difficult for me. You can have what you say, son. And he was, he was gentle and encouraging. And I went on, and I didn't, I didn't do well in the first time around. But I went to a second round of Algebra 11. And my then-girlfriend, and now wife of 25 years, was sitting behind me, and she got me through Algebra 11. <laughs> and I, I begin there because... Uh, uh, the story that dad had offered or the reflections he offered at that time are fitting for this moment that we found ourselves in because he said son there is no easy way there is no easy way there's the hard way or there's the harder way what path are you going to choose when it comes to this challenge that you've got in front of you with algebra 11 and uh, i'll touch on this uh, um, as as my uh, um, intervention occurs here, I'd like to spend about the next 25 minutes offering some reflections uh, in, in what I feel is a tremendous opportunity. And for, for myself, I feel that our people, the Indigenous peoples of these lands, I think that us in this country as Canada, uh, I think this is really our time. This is our time to come together in a tremendous way, to learn from where it is that we've, we've been, to understand the context we're within right now, and choose, uh, choose a path forward that uh, can, can all get, all, we can all be involved in, we can all participate in, and we can, we can all drive forward uh, together. One of, the, uh, one of the reflections that we can begin with is by being here, we can think about the original treaties. Uh, the, 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 the treaties that were made with the Maliseet, with the Mi'kmaq, with indigenous peoples throughout the lands. As you know, the indigenous peoples of, of this region first entered into treaty with the British Crown in 1725. This and subsequent treaties were treaties of peace and friendship. That's the theme upon which the Assembly of First Nations will be returning under the leadership of Regional Chief Roger Augustine to our summer assembly. We're coming back en masse uh, this summer in July. Uh, First Nations from uh, right across the continent will be coming here. And uh, the theme is in the spirit of peace and friendship. And these treaties uh, can today still instruct us and guide us on the way forward. As was, uh, was mentioned, uh, I have uh, been in the role of, of National Chief and um, his honor and I, we took our offices around the same time, which is one of the reasons why we spoke. I was elected in, in July of 2009 and uh, really not an unexpected path in life, I have to say. Um, I essentially was expecting to become a chef because mom was such a good cook. She inspired me at a young age. And we are, as I've said, we are a long ways from home. Uh, how is it, as those of you who've been to Mum's speeches or talks is a fishing village in the west coast of Vancouver Island, as far west as you can go. Um, next stop, Japan, at the end of the Trans-Canada Highway. And uh, when Mum gives her talks, she reflects on uh, the moment when she's speaking. So right now, um, late spring, early summer, and, and the fishing that's going on, I receive updates all the time from home. And uh, we're people of the ocean, and so it's always wonderful to come to uh, the Atlantic coast. And we're people, and as are others, with a complex governing system. It's been often recognized that I come from a hereditary chief lineage and this, uh, this uh, lineage and this governing system is still in place back home, uh, guided by um, laws of responsibility, of, of respect, of ceremony, such as what we've observed here today, and a guiding philosophy about, inter, about, about being interrelated, interconnected, hishuk nishtsawak, as we say. And I remember so fondly and have lots of uh, memories of being a, a young boy in my village and having the elders come and, and uh, tell me stories, take, take me aside, tell me to take some time away from playing, to understand the stories of our people. These are stories that uh, mom shares in, in, her, in her work today, stories of, 
laws of the wisdom of our, of our communities. Also stories of our struggle. I, I understand Dr. Wilton Little, Little Child was here on behalf of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, speaking uh, very plainly and forthright in, in a manner uh, that is necessary when talking about the real struggles. And these are stories that instruct me to this day in my role. I do, though, stand uh, before you uh, um, feeling very, uh, I think, proud is one way to describe it, about the leadership of our people over the course of history and that we are indeed walking in their footsteps. And that uh, there's an important link that's being maintained when the children said that prayer about carrying on the language, they translated for us the prayer about this is the language of our people that we've learned from our grandparents and now it's our turn so that we make sure it survives and passes on to the next generation. Uh, young people are so often told they're the leaders of, of tomorrow, the leaders of the future. That's an example of young people demonstrating leadership right now for all of us, including for the adults in the room, can learn from that sort of an example. And I think about the important contribution that uh, Professor Hackett Fisher has made in his book, Champlain's Dream. There's been other authors as well. Um, John Ralston Saul in his book, uh, Truce About Canada, uh, A Fair Country. And really in essence, provoking uh, thinking. That which the Federation in holding these events is asking us to do is to think more deeply. And I, and I would suggest opening up space. And I've been telling, um, I think, and through my speeches, people about his book for, for some time now. Really glad, and I was just like a groupie running up to get my book signed. And his, his book on Champlain, really it was about uh, a different uh, dream that perhaps people have understood that uh, has been there since the very creation of this country. And um, this dream was of a society based on partnership, real partnership between Indigenous peoples and Europeans to strengthen and to enrich one another. And he talked about uh, a number of things, including um, deep change. Uh, deep changes that have occurred over the course of history that have helped create Canada, um, the, the strong and vibrant culture in Quebec, the links to Europe. Uh, he very much was a transmitter of, of culture and thinking and philosophy. And Hackett uh, Fisher, um, he documents that, that uh, this plan was completely the opposite of what was being directed by colonial governments the world over at the time of Champlain. The reality was one of displacement. It was one of war, of enslavement. That those were the objectives across the Americas and across the Caribbean. But here Champlain sets out to create a different society, one that is based on mutual respect and harmony. And it was these very same values that were later enshrined in the treaties that were entered into right here in these territories that we're going to once again celebrate um, when we come together in our, in our annual assembly in July. And so today, as has been indicated, uh, and quite naturally for myself personally, there is a focus on the critical issue of First Nations education and a better future for our, our, our next generations. And this is, in fact, uh, really talking about the dreams of all of our ancestors. Um, it's often said we are all treaty people. It's not just First Nations who sat down and engaged in these relationships. They belong to all Canadians, whether first generation or, or been here many generations. It's something that our collective ancestors have done. We also know that we have a lot of work to do, that the dream that was articulated has not been the experience and reality of First Nations across the country. Our own people, the New Channel, uh, it was remarked uh, by the early ex explorers when they were writing about our people that they must be the wealthiest people on earth, the New Channel on the West Coast. And here, the Champ Champlain Road on the east coast of the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet and the Huron, that they were the finest humans he had ever seen. And Hackett Fisher, for those of you who were in his session, talked about this, didn't he, about uh, the notion of humanity. That they were the finest humans he had ever seen, and he marveled at their systems of, of agriculture, fisheries, hunting, and trade. And we, of course, know through others who have spoken, including Dr. Wilton Littlechild, that sadly that, that's not the story of today that there has been a constant and aggressive erosion of our economies and that today we suffer from what I think most people now understand are the poor socioeconomic conditions of all Canadians. Dr. Wilton Littlechild has been particularly active at the international level and uh, was one of those who uh, was actively pursuing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I was just at the UN in New York 
And we also are active with the international indigenous community, which also I think suggests an opportunity that we have here in Canada to demonstrate and build on the international human rights reputation that we have, to get to work in this area so that we can indeed step up and be a leader when it comes to indigenous rights issues as well. Because Canada, while we rank consistently within the top 10 on the UN indexes, First Nations we know fall far behind, often being compared to developing and third world nations, um, suffering uh, from ravaging rates in, in 30 times the rates of TB than the national average. Right now, an education uh, success, success gap that will take at the current rate over two decades to close. And so this then becomes about the potential of our children who right now are more apt to end up in jail, in fact, than to graduate from school. So this is a harsh reality that we face. And in the role that I have as National Chief, I have the great privilege to not only to speak to esteemed audiences like this, but as I did last week, to be in Pengasi in uh, northern Manitoba, a community of 300, or recently at the Peguis uh, uh, First Nations, and to see the challenges that our communities face. Children often greeting me at airports with signs saying, Sean, um, what we want is a school, or we want a gym, or we want a playground. And there'll be, there'll be uh, school-aged children coming and, and greeting me at the airports when I, when I arrive, and they're looking for some sense of, of hope. And these are often, for me, the most powerful moments, just with our people sitting with them in their, in their communities, in their living rooms. And this is both in the urban settings, whether it's downtown Toronto, the close to 100,000 or more Indigenous people um, that are in uh, downtown Vancouver, um, in the cities, uh, in places like Winnipeg. And if you saw the headlines of things that, like the flooding that have happened throughout the country, you know, the Atlantic has been hit as well. These are crises that very often I'm called on. Um, it, tornadoes in Saskatchewan. I know in Peguis, uh, they've had something like five or six uh, flood events in the last three years for the community and it means kids have to leave and not be in school uh, for several weeks at a time, sometimes months. We also know that there's been an inordinate amount of studies that have been done uh, about many of these challenges. I can think back to the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples is now 15 years old. And all of these studies, a number of them have concluded that public policy relating to our peoples has resoundingly failed, failed to achieve its objectives and failed our peoples. Have a tremendous amount of respect, as I know many do, for the outgoing uh, Auditor General, Sheila Fraser, for an incredible tenure and body of work, beyond, in many respects, beyond reproach. In speaking at her uh, final public event as Auditor General, she said that the lack of improvement in conditions on First Nations reserves was, quote unquote, truly shocking. And over the course of her 10-year mandate, she produced 31 audit reports on First Nations issues, including education. And last year, Indian and Northern Affairs Canada, whose name has changed, reported there was little or no progress in the well-being of First Nations communities, a gap that uh, Ms. Fraser called unacceptable. So this is about recognizing um, these challenges and the fact that this cannot continue. We cannot, we simply cannot, especially in the face of those young people um, Elder Bear that you had gathered with others. We can't lose another generation to the sense of hopelessness and despair that we know is, is still a stark reality out there. And yet, as we, we must remind ourselves, and as Dr. Wilton Littlechild also I know did, uh, we need to also see the opportunity and have reason for optimism. There's the drive and the energy of the young people that uh, I meet all the time, and it's absolutely infectious. The, we also see incredible dedication of the leadership and the absolute resilience of, of the elders in our communities to, uh, to uh, encourage us on and encourage us forward. We know, though, that there, these challenges are, in, in many cases, very deep. A K-12 graduation rate in places like Northern Ontario that, as I stand here, is 28%. And education, as we know, as is so often said, is the spark that will light the fire of potential in people. And so we make a direct link here um, with what, the, what education can do for our people. We need to ensure that we encourage them to understand that when they do complete high school, they're twice as likely to get a job. When they graduate from university, their earnings triple. And so this is where the story of hope and opportunity begins. We know through the intervention of Dr. Wilton Littlechild that 
Residential school was used as a tool of oppression and hold people down. And it was emphasizing the removal of identities, the fracturing of families, and the elimination of our ways of communication and of thinking. And as recognized by renowned studies, including one from 2009 by the United Nations, a major factor contributing to the disadvantaged position of indigenous peoples is the lack of quality education. And the report concluded that education is recognized as both a human right in itself and an indispensable means of realizing other human rights and fundamental freedoms, the primar primary vehicle by which economically and socially marginalized peoples can lift themselves out of poverty and obtain the, the means to participate fully in their communities. So education is increasingly recognized as one of the best long-term financial investments that states can make. Now we have, as, I've, as you've been hearing, a powerful family legacy. I should point out that my dad was recognized as the first, if not one of the first, graduates from an academic um, doctoral degree program at University of British Columbia, but, but perhaps more broadly than that. And dad's now 72, right, mom? He's now 72, and he did this when he was 55, in the mid-50s, not that long ago. So you can see we're talking about a relatively short period of time when we've been enjoying measures of success that my dad always reminds me. He says it wasn't easy, and he tells me there are various reasons and the various ways in which it was a real uphill battle for him, not just the regular academic rigor, but beyond the, the regular academic rigor, challenges that he faced. And thankfully, that's trailblazing for people like myself and others that are coming behind. And his late mother, my late grandmother, um, passed away not uh, too long ago, a few years ago. She, she raised dad and uh, 16 other siblings. And I always, I always like to, to mention she outlived three husbands. She was a tough, tough West Coast woman, all of whom went to residential school and have the kinds of experience that Dr. Littlechild and all of the challenges that he talked about. And yet uh, here dad succeeded and uh, it's because of his late mom and the sort of legacy that she left us. She talked to me as a grandson and, and pulled, uh, pulled me aside and, and she says, uh, she said many things to me, but in the area of education, she says, I raised all my kids to be fighters. I myself was a fighter. Grandson, we don't have to fight our fight with our fists any longer. We fight our fight with education. I shared those words uh, at, at her funeral as, uh, as, as her legacy to our family. But I think those words are absolutely important for, for all of us to reflect on. When the elders who've been through so much are reflecting on their personal lives, and what are the tools? What are the tools if education was a tool of oppression to hold us down? Should not now education be the tool of freedom, to be the tool of liberty? That's the message that my late grandmother was offering up in her final days. And I'm very thankful, very thank thankful for that sort of a family legacy. And so today our challenge then becomes one of overcoming the past, the challenges that we've come through. To set about a commitment to reconciliation, to respect and prosperity, one of mutual hope and opportunity. And to forever turning education from that instrument of oppression to a tool of liberation. And we have guides that we can look to along the way. I've already talked about the treaty promise that, uh, that were set out by the ancestors even prior to Confederation. To me, I see this as the true spirit and the true nature of the founding of this very country of Canada. In this same spirit, we now, including every single person that's here in this room, has the opportunity, and I would submit the shared responsibility and obligation to work together to lift up every single child in all of our villages and communities and First Nations across the country. And we do have new maps that can help guide us in this work, this journey of reconciliation to confirm justice, fairness, and opportunity. As uh, Willie Littlechild would have said almost exactly three years ago when I was there with my late grandmother when this happened, Prime Minister Stephen Harper apologized to the survivors of residential schools and committed to work with us on a path forward of reconciliation. And this was a very important moment. So too was November 12th of last year when Canada finally removed itself from isolation in the global family, reversed its opposition and expressed support for the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This offers, I think, an important foundation, as well as commitments to work together 
to find new paths forward grounded in mutual respect and partnership and providing us with a very clear task. All of Canada has a tremendous and shared stake in turning this around. By closing the education and labor force gaps in one generation, there would be an estimated increase of 400 billion in output to the Canadian economy and savings of government expenditures of 115 billion. So we have come together, First Nations leadership, to affirm the clear priority for education. And as was said here, to, to offer up a call to action to all Canadians to join us in this effort, looking at five principal components, reconciliation, fiscal guarantee, sustainability, work on the systems, and then I think importantly, partnerships. Reconciliation is about interjurisdictional recognition, having all of the jurisdictions, Canada, federal, provincial, territorial, recognize the reality and the rights of First Nations, our treaty rights, our Aboriginal title and rights that are protected in, in the Constitution, that were forged in treaties and now affirmed in the UN Declaration. And we need to reconcile this reality within the acts that govern education in this country. Reconciliation creates the opportunity for every Canadian to learn about and from Indigenous peoples of this land, to begin anew the understanding of the proud Indigenous heritage, the great promise of working together in the future. Professor Hackett Fisher talked about this. The Treaty Number 3 in Northern Ontario talks about a similar theme. You provide, you give me your child so that I might teach him or her and I'll do the same so that you might teach my child about yourself. That notion of mutual understanding. We're going to and will continue to and I'm thankful for the support that we've received from the Ministers of Education right across the country at the provincial and territorial level that we work together on this as well as the Ministers of Aboriginal Affairs. We will continue to encourage the federal government to come to the table with us, join us in this effort so that we can have some very focused process and a clear commitment. I'm thankful that the federal government uh, has uh, uh, committed to us to work on a national panel on K-12 education. We see that as, a, as an important entry point. So the first area is around reconciliation. The second is about needing a clear fiscal guarantee. Many do not realize that Every Canadian enjoys certain basic services guaranteed through legal framework. Uh, that this is not the case for First Nations education. It's a mere program line and it's subject to reallocation, reduction and changes every single year to the ebb and flow and the shifting winds of politics. Thirdly is about sustainability. To have an equitable rate of, of growth. During the federal election, uh, you may have um, remembered that uh, the Conservatives and Liberals for that matter, quickly committed to rates of growth at over 6% for health and education and provincial transfers. These same services have been capped for First Nations at 2% for over a decade. This at a time when our population is growing and in fact it's, uh, it's booming and very youthful. So we must establish a stable, equitable and secure fiscal framework that addresses these current gaps. In, in many cases, the gap is two to $3,000 less per First Nations child than, a children in the, than ch children in the mainstream system, but it, in other cases it grows to $7,000 per child. The fourth area is about our systems. The rest of Canada long ago abandoned the old schoolhouse model of small schools operating in isolation. A modern system requires second and third level supports to support curriculum, training, special services, as well as to ensure language and cultural instruction. This builds on the work of leaders uh, Going back to the 70s, who established the notion of Indian control, of Indian education, chiefs have affirmed this in, in an updated version, if you will, at the Assembly of First Nations to pursue First Nations control of First Nations education. We were, I was encouraging the Prime Minister to get on with endorsing the declaration and then let's work together to implement it and let's choose education as the first area that we do so. Just uh, last month, I think, to underscore some of the challenges that we have for those who maybe are aware of this story from Nishnabe Aski Nation in Ontario. There's the tragic uh, story of Jordan, Jordan Wabase, a hockey star attending high school 100, 100 uh, miles away from his home in Thunder Bay. And uh, tragically, he died there alone, unsupported. I think he was in his, uh, in his early mid-teens, 15 years old. And uh, in fact, there's been seven such deaths in Thunder Bay alone over the last several years. 
And so uh, as much as I might have complained back in the day of going to school and having dad be my teacher, principal, mom's the uh, um, substitute teacher, and then I'd see them at the dinner table, um, as you get older, you really appreciate these things. Because make no mistake about it, these tragedies are happening as we speak and as we sit here. These stories, though, must, they must do more than just be important reminders. I feel that they must compel action and compel all of us to stand up and say, no more. No more must a child struggle and suffer alone while trying to get an education. We have to find new ways to support them for those that do have to leave home. I've been to these communities where there is no school, where some kids have not gone to school for up to two years. That's a reality in, in many of these impoverished communities in the far north especially, northern Manitoba, northern Ontario. We have to find ways to use new technologies, the use of the online learning. You'll remember um, dial-up for the internet? It's just this side of the crank phone. That's what I used in order to get my education, was, was dial-up, was all that was available out there. So new technologies are, are really critical, and uh, new investments, of course, to keep them home and support them in their communities. And this brings me to the last and, and I think really cre uh, critical point is around support and partnerships. We need to look to replace the legacy of those residential schools that were there for over 150 years with a vibrant new learning culture in every First Nations grounded in our heritage, in our identity, in our, in our language. That we find a new confidence that we can and will resume a rightful place as proud nations within the Canadian Federation and within the North American economy. To get there, we need to work with every university, every college, school boards, corporations, foundations, and indeed every Canadian. We've spoken directly to many of you, presidents. I always bump into Paul Davidson. He's, we're stalking each other, president of AUCC, <laughs> encouraging um, all of the colleagues and the senior leadership in academia um, to ask them what they might be able to do to not only to invite applications to their schools, but to build relationships in the spirit of those treaties with First Nations. Support research partnerships. Provide key supports to First Nation schools at the K-12 level through service learning, mentorship pro uh, programming. I think specifically about an encouragement from Doreen Salas from Tobik, who says we need to address lit literacy for success at the higher levels of education. There's work that we can do in that specific area. Specialized learning camps all premised on the funda fundamental principle of mutual respect. We've looked to school boards to begin an open dialogue of mutual support as well, sharing knowledge and being enriched by the opportunities to learn and to share the Indigenous reality of Canada. We've reached out to the corporate sector. I never thought I'd find myself in some of the boardrooms that I have on Bay Street, reaching out to the corporate sector, to the finance sector, as well as to the foundations and philanthropic community who are often doing amazing work, building schools in South Africa and and delivering clean water to communities in Africa. Um, efforts that would also be welcome in many of the communities here in Canada. And, uh, and also to, to suggest that there's an enrichment that occurs about, about learning and sharing about the indigenous reality of Canada. I know that our, many of the communities, like those children who have those signs, they don't have access to resources for things like gymnasiums, for rec programs and cultural programming. We reach out and are continuing to reach out to all aspects of civil society, having with engagement with them a unique opportunity to learn, share, and support building bridges with our communities. They can play a real important and active role by focusing on the success of every single child in our communities, on the needs and the opportunities for us to, to work together become incredibly clear. We cannot look at a child that's in need and begin first to find fault or to cast blame. But really, this is about rallying together. It's about sharing responsibility, full responsibility. It's about rising to the challenge in this generation by taking action that includes what we as individuals can do every day. It's about sharing knowledge, mentoring, offering help from our own skills and our own backgrounds, which is why each one of you here, I think, can help in a tremendous way. The, econ the, uh, the economic community is looking at our community and they're recognizing that uh, our youth are a critical part of, of the workforce of tomorrow. We know that Canada will face a labor shortage in 2017. Canada's wondering how it's going to pay for the pensions. How is it going to pay for health care? I've always got my hand up over here saying, look at us, look at us. 
You heard the economic arguments about the reason to invest in our community and they're powerful ones. We need to look to the young people, not just as uh, actors uh, in, a, in a market economy, but actors in a civil society. They can be tremendous and powerful with their energy, their inspiration to lead their communities towards a more healthy and productive future. They are the agents of positive social change and social justice, and they deserve nothing less than our full support. So these steps that I've uh, laid out here are essentially the call to action, and they're urgently needed. These steps move us away from an assumption of dependence to sustainable funding for basic services that are enjoyed by all Canadians. Structurally, we also need to move from unilateral delegation, which has been our past, one plagued with conflict over the course of history, to harmonization and accountability among all jurisdictions. On a more basic level, this is as, as I've been suggesting here, moving us from a sense of failure to one of hope, from one of despair, deep despair, to opportunity. And as I've been saying here, um, and I was referencing these stories about, uh, about uh, um, things that my father said, this does become about change. And as Hackett Fisher said, deep change that is required. And so we need a strategy for this change ma management. We've seen other major change movements over the course of recent history, whether it was in the environmental, climate change movement, women's rights. I was there at the inauguration of, of the first African-American president. Uh, those things didn't happen overnight either. We've seen though major uprisings, haven't we, in the Middle East that have happened overnight, literally, seemingly, to those of us outside of that context. That's the way it felt. A rapid rise and increase in, in consciousness and, and activism and movement. And I'm suggesting strongly here that we need a similar increase in the rate and pace and deep change in issues when it comes for First Nations as well as in the relationship between First Nations and the rest of Canada. And in many, res in many respects, this is not only about confronting the truth and uh, not setting aside this notion that this is too complex for us, that it's too difficult to understand. They are difficult con conversations, but we've got to tackle these issues absolutely head on and establish or reestablish the trust that the ancestors were forging in the treaties. Authors like Stephen Covey illustrate how and why when trust is increased, so too is the speed with which that you can accomplish change. The costs associated are also impacted directly. When there is trust, the cost of change and progress are greatly reduced. And so this is about re returning to the sentiments that, that, er that were there as the original trust in the treaty relationships. Hackett Fisher talked about the military and trade alliances as well. Those have been eroded and dis destroyed, in fact, through decades of dislocation, oppression, and denial of basic rights and freedoms. Today, First Nations, and I've already alluded to this, we cons consume so much of our energy and resources fighting court battles. The New Channel just finished winning a court case in the area of fisheries. We, our, rec our right to fish and fish commercially was just recognized. The Canada appealed it, then we won the appeal. We'll just keep winning. We got over 40 court cases that keep affirming the reality. When is it that we're gonna reckon with this reality and find a new way forward? And this conflict is, is characteristic of, in essence, a deep lack of trust. And perhaps not having a, a real shared understanding about where we've come from and where we are, which is the reason why contributions like Champlain's Dream are so important to keeping the space open. Transforming our relationship and advancing reconciliation must never lose sight of this notion of the necessity of building trust. Starting with education, then, and you as leaders in this particular area, uh, this is where your leadership is greatly and deeply needed to help build um, this trust. With trust, we can then work to remove the fear, we can create momentum, and we can build hope. Building trust is not something that's easy, but I hearken back to the words of my dad, that's either hard or harder. What's the path that we're going to choose? It will require listening, creativity. It will require understanding that we demonstrate mutual accountability and transparency and improved communication. And lastly, as my late grandmother said, when we were at the, the apology that the Prime Minister offered up, she talked about having a vision. She was a little lady, but she said she was holding this big, dark, heavy, something she didn't quite understand. And she says, grandson, I understand now what that vision was all about. 
I was trying to push over, turn this heavy page in a dark chapter in our history, and I realized that I couldn't do this on my own. It's going to take every single one of us, she told me, to turn this dark, heavy page in this, this chapter in our history and uh, so that we can turn this new, to a new page and start writing one filled with hope and optimism. And so in the memory of my late granny, that's our task here today. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share some thoughts. Thank you for your compelling words, Chief Art Leo. My name is Melinda Smith, and I'm the Vice President Equity Issues at the Canadian Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences. Chief Art Leo, we are inspired by your, your vision, uh, your hope and optimism, and your call to action. Uh, and we are inspired by your call to create a more equitable, accessible, and supportive um, educational system. Um, I think you will find in this audience uh, of the Congress of Humanities and Social Sciences those who are prepared to heed that call to cite the report of the AUCC. We have time for about 10 minutes of questions, so if people have uh, questions that they can use the, the microphones in the two aisles, we'll ask that you identify yourself and if you can keep your questions fairly brief, that would be appreciated. Yes, um, my name is Andrea Bear Nicholas, and I'm the Chair of Native Studies here at St. Thomas. And uh, I want to thank you for your heartfelt presentation, Sean, and, um, and for all of the hope that you put out there. But I do, there is one concern that I have. Um, I guess, you know, I've been around long enough to know that goodwill and trust and faith in what people can do working together will happen, will come along. But as one of my mentors has said, Dorothy Lazor, who has started the Native Language Immersion Training programs almost around the world in the last um, few decades, is we've been nice for too long. And being kind is, and, and generous and sharing is, is one thing that we're strong at. We've actually been taught in residential schools and other schools to not speak back, to not um, stand up and offend anybody. And sometimes we have to learn to do that. And I guess what I wanted to say is that I'm, I'm aware of a resolution that the AFN passed at Christmas time. And what I would ask is that you might bring it into your presentations a little more. It's the resolution calling on Canada to pass a law that gives us the right to have schools in our own language because, because, a, when children really know how to speak their mother tongue, they do better in school. And there's a lot of research around that, um, that issue that schooling in mother tongue has actually produced excellent results wherever it's happened. But B, it's an opportunity to save our languages because they say if you're, school, if you're not schooled in your mother tongue, not teaching, but if you're schooled in your mother tongue as the medium of instruction, our languages will live and we will have a future. And unless we're really pushing for that, and I realize that, that the AFN has t taken on many resolutions, but I would really like to hear that resolution be front and center because we really have to push hard on just that one, and I think it will make a huge difference on the two fronts that you're concerned about. So thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I, 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 take, I take your advice and your guidance, and. Uh, I thank you for your leadership as well. We've had the opportunity to talk about this on a number of times. And um, so I, I take up your challenge to, to ensure to do that. Also, when the, when the education panel effort is happening, um, this was not an effort to have another big, long report. This is about moving to action, the likes of which you're suggesting is required. And so I also am going to be needing some help and support and push in this very same area in this, in this short little while. The Prime Minister before the election had committed through this panel to say, let's work with First Nations to transform education in a manner that will work for us. And I also agree that uh, the notion about being kind, we're raised always to be careful not to injure the spirit uh, of another, 
to be, understand the humanity and the, and the spirit of another. Um, yet having said that, we can be very forceful and confronting as we are through the courts. We'll continue to go to the uh, United Nations and the Organization of American States levels. And in fact, for the first time in history, the First Nations, the Assembly of First Nations have created a First Nations Rights Fund that if we need to do continual legal work in the area of treaties, things like the treaty right to education, the right of our children to be educated in their language, make no mistake about it, the resolve is deep to follow what, you, what you're encouraging here. What we're asking others to do, of course, and the reason why we're reaching out to Canadians is let's break that, that pattern of conflict, of deep mistrust, that lack of, of uh, willingness to really confront these challenges, and let, let's accept her advice and do exactly what's required for the children. My suggestion only is that let's get everybody in this room to stand up and, and stand with us and be strong and forceful on that issue. Thank you. Mary Ryan, I'm a retired school teacher, and with the help of the Canada Studies Foundation, I did develop a program that uh, developed an awareness and a, a knowledge and understanding and a better appreciation of our Native people. My concern is the expropriation of the native land, especially what has happened lately in, in Manitoba with the uh, appropriation of your land that is leaving you without fresh water and drinking water. And uh, I think what you were saying and challenging us with is that all Canadians should be touched deeply by that great need of fresh water and drinking water for your people. Thank you. Um, every day about 75,000 First Nations are exposed to um, water that cannot be uh, consumed. Uh, there's many that have no consumption orders and I visit these communities. Uh, they often don't have running water. Um, slop pails uh, for the waste. And uh, this is uh, in many communities across the country. And water is, is, uh, is very much um, an area of focus. It is linked very strongly to issues like I described around flooding. Uh, the infrastructure needs are so great in these communities. And they, be they begin to get compounded. And then it, I guess there's a sense of getting glazed eyeball effect where the issues are so great. It's like, how do, where do we begin? How do we challenge them? And uh, we do need to challenge uh, and confront all of them. We were making some progress before government fell on a bill called Bill S-11 in the area of pursuing clean drinking water. And I had some optimism that before the government fell, the government was beginning to turn and recognize that they need to work with us. That's something that Sheila Fraser, the auditor, outgoing Auditor General, is saying, is to work with First Nations to design solutions and break the pattern of unilateral decision making or Ottawa knows best. Uh, my name is uh, Serge Dupuis. I'm a doctoral student at the University of Waterloo, and I thank you for your presentation, and I admire your uh, calm in discussing uh, these issues that are often mind-boggling and very frustrating for, for those who are learning about them uh, um, for the first time. Um, I guess my question is about uh, Aboriginal education in urban areas. Um, and as we know, uh, the uh, amount of... Uh, of Aboriginals actually in, well, the highest concentration of Aboriginals in Canada is in Toronto, right, where they uh, compose a, a, a large minority of the population. Um, and I wanted to actually refer to um, a point that was made about uh, mother language education um, in, in, uh, in urban areas as being a, a tool to uh, lift outside or lift above uh, the poverty line and to, uh, as a means for cultural preservation. The example that comes to mind, being a, a Franco-Ontarian, is the uh, the um, uh, minority French language schools that were set up um, in urban areas like Toronto, like uh, Windsor and Calgary, and, and major cities across Canada as instruments to um, uplift the, the the Francophone population out of poverty and um, I, I guess to um, give them also a means of, of cultural preservation. So I was wondering if uh, the Assembly of First Nations was looking into um, examples such as those um, to address the issue, those, those two issues um, in urban areas where the population of Aboriginals is actually increasing and booming right now. Sure. Why don't we take the next two questions briefly and then we'll, we'll answer them. Yeah. 
Thanks. Okay, my name is Della Roos and I'm from the University of British Columbia. But I actually asked this question as a, a coming from Northern BC where many of my friends came in from reserves and in order to complete high school had to leave their communities. And you discussed the having to leave communities to finish education. And of course, to pursue a higher education takes them even further from home. Uh, it always struck me is that how do you maintain vibrant communities when your youth are being taken away from you in order to pursue education? And you've discussed how you might achieve, or at least partially, rec reconcile that with new technologies. The flip side of that, though, is when they go home, the lack of economic opportunity has often kept many of them away. So those that pursued education elsewhere, very few of my, of my friends from that time have gone back home. So again, how do you maintain a vibrant community when there is little education or economic opportunity for them to go home to? Nere saint originally from New Brunswick here, and uh, now at, uh, in Ottawa. And I've, uh, I've been in uh, the education system or business uh, for the last 30-some uh, years, and I was, was wondering what, what do we mean when we want our Aboriginal pe uh, people to be educated in our system? Uh, I've, I've had enough of this education to understand, I think, and appreciate that there, there's not much of uh, Aboriginal values, spiritual values, uh, cultural values that are, that are uh, presented in our, unfortunately, in our system. So if, if we want the Aboriginal people to be educated in, in this way, I'm not sure where we're heading for. Because myself, when I was educated, and I can tell you frankly, I didn't know what the Aboriginals were, although there was a reserve close to my place. And when I started social work, I did apprehend children because I didn't know what I, what I was doing. And I didn't know the, the, the context, the, the historical, the cultural and the political context in which I was taking children away from you guys. And, and now I, I understand a little bit better, but it's not through education that I got it, unfortunately. So when, when we propose a system of education that is uh, based on formal education, and I'm an edu edu educator, what can I say? What, 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 is the, what is the end result of all this for your people? and for my people too, for my grandchildren as well. So I, I was hoping maybe that, well, you refer to the traditional education and your elders and all the values and the cultural, spiritual values that these people have. And I was hoping that in some ways that we could dream of changing our education and having your elders into our system and teaching us what education is. I, I appreciate the, this opportunity very much, and I think um, to work backwards from this last uh, intervention, um, Professor Hackett Fisher talked about uh, Champlain in, in his time, and uh, that the way he interacted was one of getting to know, building a relationship, and asking permission first before he engaged in his activities. And so we look to the academic leadership across the country um, to consider what you've said perhaps as a, as a helpful guide. Um, that where we don't know or we, where we don't have those relationships, that we strike them up. Uh, that's the essence of the treaty relationship, is a relationship between people and peoples. And uh, bringing together a much higher level of, enha of enhanced understanding. And in fact, responding to those questions together. Because the place where those questions need to be responded to are in the communities where the work is, is actually taking place. I think from there we can weave together a new story at a national level, at a, at a more broad macro level, but it's gotta begin right in the communities. Who is the community that's across the river or across the railroad tracks? Who are, what, 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 uh, whose nation's territories are we within at this moment? And how does that history, how does that help shape the current context and the current environment um, that, that we're involved in? Um, weaving it back to the question around the urban, even the way we begin to talk about these issues um, to delve into a little bit deeper. The term Aboriginal is used. Not all First Nations um, welcome that, the use of that term because it, 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 uh, on the one hand, it's, it's a helpful acknowledgement. On the, on the other hand, 
it glosses over the fact that there are three constitutionally recognized indigenous peoples in the country, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. And overlapping with the urban, ish, urban uh, conversation is the, is the mainstream urban-rural divide. That's a big conversation into itself, the place of rural Canada, rural, rural Canada. And I think, there, it, it, it became, it, uh, I think there's a real challenge if we mix up the, the policy conversations of some of these areas, urban-rural, north-south, First Nations are definitely implicated here. You see, the majority of First Nations live on reserves. The, the majority are not in the urban settings. But very often there's broad policy decisions that are made because all Aboriginal peoples that are within the census, well, the majority is there, so the money and, and, and the effort go there. Meanwhile, it's a, it becomes a divisive exercise because we've just been talking about the lack of water, infrastructure, the lack of education. Well, of course, if, you've had, if you have a family who is wanting to seek education like mine, son, you better go off to take your education somewhere. And so it becomes a real, I think, uh, a double-edged sword, if you will. And it's, it, if we don't delve deeply and we don't understand the context more fully, we can exacerbate the challenge even if we're well-intended. Residential schools, after all, were also well-intended, although deeply misguided by and large because it wasn't jointly designed. And so this is where we begin to say, let's jointly design approaches. Let's have a shared understanding of what the information and the data are. One of the first things that our family did was create a post-secondary um, a private post-secondary training institute, and we established programming in the urban centers in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And I remember a young man walking into my office, and I said to my staff, I recognize this guy. Who is he? What's his name? And they said, you couldn't have ever met him because uh, his name, his last name is Williams. He, he was at birth, he was uh, uh, sent down and, and was raised in California, part of the 60s scoop, as it's now called. This is his first day, his first time in Canada. He says he comes from a village called Ahousit, and he's wondering where that is. And that's like a snapshot of our story. And that's the work that's going on in the Torontos and the Vancouver's and the Winnipeg's, is because there's still a linking back together. There's still a reconnecting that's going on. And we certainly have to support those communities. I think I said 100,000, which would be more accurate in Vancouver. It's probably over 300,000 um, in, in Greater Toronto. And we've spent time there, and the Assembly of First Nations has for its first time an urban strategy that we're developing. Because indigenous peoples who are in the urban settings, very often uh, they come from somewhere, they've left or are not connected to their home community for a multitude of reasons, many, many times not even of their own choosing. And this, this man would look in the mirror and see a new channel to house it person growing up in Southern California and have no idea what his story was and he deeply wanted to know. And so this is the story that we're, we're helping to reconnect. So it's not only non-Indigenous or others who are grappling with this. Our people are as well. And so this is where it be can become um, really about a conversation. And those, uh, those remote communities where the young person goes away and gets schooling but, but comes home and there's a sense of hopelessness and despair, um, I think that's by and large because if we look at the flooding in communities, it's because a, a major watershed will have been um, flooded in northern Manitoba to create power for Winnipeg. But the community that was there had to be dis dislocated. And the ancestors that had been buried in their traditional territories, the bones are floating to the surface of a reservoir, the water of which they can no longer drink. And they're on, they're on generators, on diesel generators, because the power is being shipped south. And so it is, it's about recognizing that in the resource industry, which is booming, that if you're going to drill a hole or mine for diamonds or run a pipe or run transmission lines, if you reach out to the First Nations, energy and power, which is why we're having an energy and international energy and mining summit in Niagara Falls next month, June 27th to the 29th, it may very well be our new fur trade. It's a major area of development across this country. We've got all our thoughts about, about these major resources, but energy is a reality in our lives every single day. And I suggest, and I've asked the question, what is the vision for energy in this country, in Canada? And I know Dr. Andrew Weaver is in this conference as well. It turns out there is no broad plan. And my encouragement is to Indigenous peoples, we have rights and responsibilities. Let's help shape a vision for the future in areas like energy, a much more sustainable future that is about mutual respect and recognition, about our relationship with the environment around us, but also the very real need to support those young people to have the dignity of a job in their home communities. It's something we can do. My daughter's created a job for herself in, 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 um, in our community in ecotourism. She went away and is getting her education. 
and she's found a way to develop a job and jobs in our own home community. And the young people can help do this, but we've got to support them.